excited to be able to uh, share this morning on Easter Sunday. In fact, so much so that I, I broke out the shirt I had been saving for a while. Um, it may not work, but I like it. So um, if you don't like it, you can put an Easter egg in your pile. So don't worry. <laughs> so how many of you excited for what God is doing in your life? Yes. Amen. So when I was praying and looking through uh, the resurrection story, and generally like to kind of look at different aspects of it, I was reading through uh, John chapter 20, and uh, some aspects of John chapter 20 just kind of stuck out and hit me. There were some phrases that we see Christ repeat several times over uh, after the resurrection, and within that, that first day of his resurrection. So before we do that, how many of you though have ever had a situation or an experience in life that left you feeling that that God had abandoned you. That somehow Jesus had disappeared. We, we've probably, if you're, if you're here this morning, I'm, I'm guessing perhaps at some point you've had that experience where you, and if you haven't, I, I pray that you will, but at some point in your life you had that experience that you knew that you knew that Jesus was real. Amen. And you knew that you knew that, that you had encountered him, that you had walked with him, kind of like you see with the disciples at that moment where they're with him and he does something, they're like, that guy. I want to be with him. And then all of a sudden life goes on, we're, we're walking with Jesus, and, and this happened with the disciples. They're going along, and this is great. He's the Messiah, he's the one. We're so excited, he's in our life. And then all of a sudden something happens that shakes your faith to the core. All of a sudden, something happens that leaves you doubting, is he actually here with me anymore? Am I the only one? How many of us have experienced that? I think every single one of us. And sometimes we can feel that, that sense that you know, God has left the building and that other people see him, but, but we feel alone and, and don't even know where to look anymore for him. We see other people, and they, they still seem to see him, they still see him, but like, God, where are you? And, and we want to have that again. We're looking, we're saying, God, where are you? And we get to a point where I don't even know where to look anymore. I, I read my Bible, and, and I go to church, and Jesus, where are you? So we see the disciples in this same thing. So our big idea this morning that we're looking at is Jesus is not abandoned. He has not been stolen away. He is alive. He is here. His peace is upon, around, and in us. If we will just look to him and believe so John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. We're going to kind of go through this here. It was early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran, she ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. So it's early in the morning, and she's going out to probably finish the, the burial preparations they weren't able to finish, take some spices and Make sure the body was, was preserved and to care for it. And she gets there, and, and the stone's completely rolled away. Now, there were supposed to be these Roman soldiers guarding it, and the other accounts would have happened. And, and just, but I love this account of John. So she gets there, and she's freaking out. Jesus is gone. And so she runs to find Peter and the other disciples. And the one whom Jesus loved. I love how John refers to himself when he's writing about himself. He doesn't say, and me. He says, and the one whom Jesus loves. And I think it's because he really understood how real and how personable Christ's love is for us. He felt that he wanted to communicate that in such a way. But anyway, so going on. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. 
So imagine with me, if you will, imagine this story taking place. I, it really helps me read the scripture. Imagine yourself in there. Imagine yourself one of the one of the disciples or one of the people in the story and that you're a part of. So imagine Mary Magdalene, she, she shows up as the person who has meant everything to them. The person that they have left their jobs and their families and have restructured their lives for that every hope, every dream, every aspiration that they have rested on this person. And this person has now been killed and murdered and has been slandered. The world was, was dark and was struggling to find meaning in what had happened over those last couple of days. And perhaps even for a reason to continue to live. The person they loved the most had been, had been crucified. And so imagine they've got all these emotions and all that grief. They just, I don't even grieve for a while. You're just weeping for a, a while. They just drain you and you're exhausted. In the midst of this exhaustion, in the, in the midst of this despair and hopelessness, they go and, and that one last remnant, his body, of that, that, that time had been real and that, that reminder of what he had done is to take it, is gone and is missing. Imagine those emotions that would have happened. She, she runs and she's, I imagine she's, she's, wait, she's crying, she's exhausted, she's hoarse, she's, she's yelling and she's running up and she's pounding, they're taking him, they're taking him, she's pounding on the door. And out of breath and crying and losing her voice from a lack of sleep and days of mourning, she shouts, he's gone. Jesus is gone. You can probably relate and moments in those lives where we're exhausted, we're emotionally drained, and we're crying out, he <coughs> And as she shouts that out, I believe it was a little moment of divine inspiration. We read that, that Peter and John, they, they both they jump up. And I imagine they both, there was a spark, they, they looked at each other. Both eyes light up with this unspoken thought of what if? What if? And the words that he spoke start to come to them. And there's that the mixture of emotions, perhaps. Both they jump up and they start running as, as fast as they could. And it was believed to be a possible three quarters of a mile that they would have probably been from where he was buried. And so they're they're running this, this short but still a long distance as hard as they can. Their lungs are burning, their adrenaline's are pumping, and their emotions are probably jumping between this elated hope and the thought that maybe, maybe he has risen from the dead. But also perhaps this, this triggering of anger, but what if he's not, and what if they took him? What if the last little bit of him they have stolen away? And sometimes we feel like that, we feel like that last little bit of hope, that last little bit we've been hanging on to, that somebody out there is trying to take it from us. Was he alive? Was he stolen away? And John most likely being younger, he, he gets to the tomb first, he runs ahead, but he pauses. His brain trying to rationalize perhaps what is what it is he's seeing and, and what his spirit is yearning for. And he kneels down carefully to, to look in. Verse 5. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there. But he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. <laughs> While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. She responded, because they have taken away my Lord. And she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. So she turned to leave him and saw someone standing there. 
And it was because Jesus, she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? She asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. I love that. She's looking right at him. She's like, tell me. Tell me where he is, and I will get him. And he's like, Mary. I think so often times in our own lives, we're the same way. We're like, God... Where, where are you? Tell me, and I will go find you. What scripture do I need to go to, God? I will go there, and I will find you, Lord. What church, what person, tell me where I need to go. What book do I need to read? What song do I need to listen to so I can find you? And the whole time, Jesus is saying, I'm right here. <clears throat> she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go, find my brothers and tell them, I have ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them this his message. Verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid. But even when we feel like God's not there anymore, it's, it's a scary feeling. And a lot of times as believers, we, we hide away. And we feel that, that the world is against us. And we, it's easy for us to want to isolate ourselves. But verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid. Of the Jewish leaders, suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Which, if you're taking notes from right down there, suddenly he appeared to them and he said, Peace be with you. <coughs> And they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, again, he said, you know, if Jesus repeats something, it's probably really, you should listen the first time. How many of you have parents who are like, no, let me tell you the second time, okay? <laughs> Jesus is much more patient than we are as parents. And he said, peace be with you. You can imagine if there were, in our time, he came in and he put one of Jesus coming and said, Hey, stop freaking out, okay? It's all right. I'm here. I'm alive. Do not be afraid. Again, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So they're afraid of behind locked doors. Mary and all the disciples, they were exhibiting great fear. They were afraid that Jesus had been taken. And just like them, so many Christians today live in fear that our culture, our government, our own failures, our sins, etc., have either stolen away or driven Jesus in the presence of God away from us. If you hear anything this morning, fear not. Peace be with you. Jesus is alive. He is here. He has not been left. He has not been stolen away. He cannot be stolen away. We do not need to live in fear. No government policies or walls can defeat the presence of God and keep Jesus out of our lives. <coughs> Peace be with you. Jesus is the peace. His presence, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, is where true peace comes from. We often, we're looking, we're looking at other things to try to find Jesus. And yes, He's in God's Word, and we need to go there and find Him there in the prayer. But, but we need to realize that His tangible presence through the Holy Spirit is with us. And sometimes we're so busy looking at the surroundings, we're looking 
at where he used to be. We're looking at that empty tomb. We're looking at that problem that had come up, and, and we're thinking there's no way he can overcome this. There's no way we can we can make through this. We're stuck looking at all the people and the surroundings in our situation that we fail to just look up and look at the face of God and listen for him to say, peace be with you. And in that moment that he spoke to them, you notice it's that same voice before we talked about the story where Jesus is going across the Sea of Galilee with them and he's in the boat and this storm starts raging, the storm of light, and they're freaking out, they're afraid. It was kind of a, a pre-story of what was going to happen. And they're, they're like, Jesus, why are you why are you sleeping? Where, why are you not involved in this? And they're freaking out and they're afraid. And, and he gets up and he says, peace. And he speaks words of peace and calm to the chaos around him. And in the same way, Jesus is speaking words of peace into our lives. If we will stop, let go, and let him. And as his peace filled them, they were filled with joy. Joy doesn't come from seeing your situation change. Joy comes from seeing Jesus in the midst of your situation. He'd still be crucified. He still had the wounds in his hands. He still had the piercing in his side. That had not changed. But what changed was God's power and authority in that situation. Renewing it, redeeming it, making all things new. And sometimes we're so busy looking for the situation to change. That we forget that Christ is there in the midst of it. And that is what we need to be looking for. Not necessarily for our situations to change, but look for Christ. He is there with us. If all hell breaks loose in your life, stop and start praising God. Because I guarantee you, Jesus is there with you, ready to do a miracle. Verse 24. One of the twelve disciples... Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. Poor Thomas. I feel a little bad for him. I mean, they've been going through this roller coaster of emotions, up and down, and all of a sudden, you know, they were kind of a nutty group anyway, and all of a sudden they're all excited, like, he's alive! And he's like, I haven't seen him. I don't even feel that sometimes. Everyone else has had Jesus in the midst. They've seen him, and we're still. I haven't had my big aha moment. They told him, "We've seen the Lord," but he replied, "I, I believe this probably could have been. You know, when we're angry, when we're afraid, bitterness kind of can set in. We get angry at God." And I, I just, it's not in I just imagine, maybe it wasn't so much that he doubted, maybe, he, you know, there was doubt, but maybe also, as we went through Lamentations, it could have been, he might have been just a little ticked off at Jesus, too. They all get to see you? I mean, you get mad at God sometimes. Oh, that person? They get the promotion? Oh, their marriage gets restored? God, what about me? And so he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. <clears throat> Sometimes we can get a little angry at God and decide to challenge God. Verse 26. I love how God does it. Sometimes we get in that moment. Something I how many of you have done this as parents? Your kids throw a little tantrum, tantrum temper tantrum. And you're about to like soothe them a little bit. You're about to kind of reward them for some good behavior, and then they just act up, and you're like, nope. And that treat stays away for an extra long time. 
I just can imagine how God sometimes, he, he could have showed up right away. But eight days later, he, he lets Thomas stew on this for eight days. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, at the door, <coughs> Jesus was standing among them. It doesn't matter what your situation, what your life circumstance is, there is nothing in your life that can lock Jesus out. There doesn't matter what sin you struggle with, there is not a lock that can keep Christ out of the midst of your life and situation. So he appears to them again in the midst of this room. Peace be with you. He says it again. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand to the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. I believe this is put in here because we, we all, I think, relate to Thomas. It's easier for us to believe if we can physically touch and see something. But we also know through the Holy Spirit, that Jesus appears to us. Through his word, he's standing there, and we experience the tangible presence of God. And he's speaking to us. Peace be with you. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. I love how John wraps up verse 30. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life by the power of His name. And he's saying there, Jesus is alive. He is who he said he is. And there is power in his name. There is power in his presence. And he is standing with us. Even inside those, those secret compartments of our lives that we, we lock and we hide away in fear. Jesus is standing in the middle of that this morning in our lives, and he's looking at each and every one of us, and he's saying, I'm here. Peace be with you. <coughs> and that resurrection power of his life is what he's wanting to put within us. We share in the resurrection of Christ. We not only have that promise of, of resurrecting eternally with Him, but even now, spiritually, resurrecting to life. As we get ready to play this video, uh, this song, I want to invite us to respond this morning to Jesus. I want us to imagine Jesus is standing here with us. He's appeared in this room. We know He is here with us. And that he is inviting us. He's inviting us to receive his peace. He's inviting us to receive him and to believe in him. See, the other disciples, they had a joy because, yes, they believed. And Thomas could have, if he had just heard their testimony and joined and celebrated with them and just believed, he at that very moment wouldn't have to have waited. Those eight days could have received Christ's peace and that joy as well. And I want to invite us this morning, don't wait, don't keep saying, okay, God, show me this, show me that. Receive right now that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And believe and receive that peace and that joy.
that comes from God. And I want to invite us to respond. If you want to stand, if you want to kneel, if you want to raise your hands, come to the front and kneel. But however you feel led in your spirit, respond to Jesus. If he was standing here this morning saying, Peace be with you, how would you respond? He is here. He is with us. And he is saying, Peace be with you. Be with you. Because I am with you.